To many, the great outdoors brings a sense of calm and relaxation, a place to unwind and leave the worries of civilization behind you. To others, it is a place that harbors dangers that can be grim reflections of ourselves, a breeding ground for some of our worst nightmares, those that seek to rip away that which is most precious to us. Welcome to Outdoor Terrace, the show where I share with you real people's allegedly true stories of the terrifying things they've encountered in the world beyond the borders of our stone streets. If you have a story of your own to share, send it to me at darkstories.org and stop by eeriecast.com if you want to hear more scary stories from me. If you like what you hear, leave Outdoor Terror as a rating and review on Spotify and Apple. Thank you. Now feed that fire another log, because the night is young, and we're about to begin. We start off with a story entitled, The Thing That Replaced My Brother, by user I Saw Its Face 1223. I was sitting in the living room playing games on my Xbox. My mother was in the dining room, and my father had just walked in from the garage after getting wood for the furnace. My mum was on her laptop, working for some clients. It was around 9pm. My dad walked into the dining room and got a call. Pulling out his phone, he answered it. It was my brother. He had crashed his car into a ditch. He said he could barely get a sentence out. I didn't hear what he was saying, but I knew it was bad the way my dad was talking to him. Charles? Charles, are you there? My dad said into the phone. He crashed into a ditch on the I-95 next to his friend's house. He was going to a game night. The damage wasn't the worst. He wrecked the suspension on the right side of his car and the tire was in pieces. He himself was shaken up and was afraid at how mad Dad would be. It was a nice first car. It's just like my dad's, only a few years newer. When my dad was talking to him, I sat up from the couch and walked over to my mum. Oh no... I said under my breath, knowing that he had crashed his car. I had a bad feeling about that night. My stomach felt off, and decided not to go to the games night myself. Thank God that I didn't. I would have been more injured by being on the passenger side. My mum and I followed my dad as he walked into the kitchen. He was still on the phone to my brother, and he told him that we were coming to pick him up. I grabbed my coat, hugged my mum goodbye and went through the garage and out to my dad's car. We drove off in silence, him not saying a word, me not wanting to break the silence. It was pitch black outside, the darkness so thick it felt like you could swim through it. My dad grew up in the area and knew all of the roads, so he knew exactly where my brother was. Around 15 minutes later, we came up to my brother who was flagging us down so we could see him. I immediately got the need to puke. I didn't know why, but I had a horrible feeling when I saw him. He looked beat up, but he wasn't bleeding in any way. He was pale, looked as if he was sick as I was. We got out of the car and walked up to him. Where is it? My dad asked. It's over here, Charles said in a depressing voice. He led us to the ditch where the car was, whilst I sat down on top of the hill. My dad looked at it for a while, anger creeping into his expression. He could just tell by the way he was breathing alone. It was so cold outside. The jacket I was wearing was nice and plump, but for some reason it did me no good. Dad didn't say another word for a few minutes. He used a rope in his car to try and get the other car out. It took a few tries, but eventually it did work out. Whilst my dad was in the car, I walked up to Charles and asked him if he was okay. Knowing that some of the worst injuries are subdermal and you can't see them. He looked so worried and shaken up. He said he was fine, but I could tell something was off about him. We all got into my father's car and started our drive back. The silence was incredibly deafening. No one dared to say a word. We got back to the house, and Charles immediately went to his room. How is it? 
my mum asked. It's totaled, my dad responded. All fenders torn off. If he had his brother in the car, it would have been badly injured. He continued. I didn't say anything. I was scared for my brother. He just bought a great car, and then he ruined it. I also didn't want him getting in any more trouble. I started walking back to the living room where the Xbox is. But I passed the hallway where my brother's door was open, and I took a quick glance. I saw him hunched over, with his neck in a weird position as he was looking around his room. I passed the hallway and stopped, trying to process what the heck he was doing. He took a step back to look through the hallway again, and he was standing there normally. I was kind of shocked by it. It was a very sudden movement. I thought he was just being weird or testing himself to see if it was hurt. I do those too when I pull a muscle. I test to see the range of which I can move again. I didn't really think much of it, so I kept playing games. By the time I got off, it was around 11 o'clock at night. Went downstairs into my room and got some sleep. Though my dreams were awful. I dreamt of shadows that were watching me. People I knew, close friends that were torturing me. Soon enough, I woke up in a cold sweat at around 2.40. I got up, went up the stairs to get a glass of water. I drank that glass, filled it up again, and drank that down too. God, I was thirsty. I walked around the house. Somehow it felt hollow, uncanny, like something didn't belong. I walked towards the hallway to see if my mum had gone to sleep. She usually stays up late while scrolling on her phone. I peeked into her room, and I saw that they were both sleeping and snoring. Content. Then I went to check on Charles. I opened his door. He was still standing there. He looked at me. His movements stiff, his gaze towards me, seemed like he saw right through my skin and into my soul. Hey, why are you standing there? I asked. He can't sleep. I'm so scared. He responded whilst his eyes were tearing up. I rarely ever see Charles cry. He seemed more normal than usual. It's okay, man. Dad will get over it. He always does. There's nothing in the world that you can do that will make him stop loving you, I said, trying my best to cheer him up. You're right. He responded as he moved towards his bed and got in it. Good night. I love you, I said as I was slowly shutting the door. He replied, saying the same. I left the door very slightly cracked and watched him for a moment. He didn't blink once. Didn't close his eyes for a second. I backed away and went downstairs. I usually keep a knife in my bedside drawer... Strange, I know, but you can never be too careful. But I brought it out, and I sat it by my bed. I don't know why I did this, but I could tell something wasn't right, and it just made me feel a lot safer. The next few days seemed normal. He had the same habits, always at his phone at the table whilst we were eating breakfast and preparing for school. I think the days were normal because I didn't see much of him during the day. Except for when we got home. I guess he was just shaken up by the night of the crash. About four days after it, my dad asked me to help him haul some wood onto our back porch. I happily agreed because I liked stacking wood. It was good exercise and got you outside. We walked out onto the back porch and then my dad gets a phone call. It was Charles, who I thought was inside at the moment. My dad picked it up. I've never seen more fear in his eyes. Charles was screaming into the phone. I could hear what he was saying. Dad, it looks like me, but don't trust it. It's not me, Dad. Stay away from it. It was in the road. I swerved into the ditch. It attacked me. It cut my leg and took part of my skin. It ate it and started mutating into an exact duplicate of me. I saw it happen before my own eyes, Dad. Is it with you? It's inside, he said quietly. Where are you? He continued. 
I'm in Jake's house. I had to crawl here because of what it did to my leg. I'm sorry I couldn't contact you sooner. I was out cold for days. They found me outside their front porch. But listen, you need to get Mom and Tyler out of there as soon as possible. I heard everything. My heart was beating out of my chest. I knew something wasn't right. I ran inside of the house and went to my mom's room. I ran up to her and told her that Charles isn't real and that we needed to run. She didn't understand, so I had to explain what had just happened. I was terrified. She got out of bed, and we walked downstairs, past the dining room, past Charles's room, putting our shoes on. I was pushing my mom to move faster. I knew that that thing in my brother's room was not him now. I'd read stories of these creatures, skinwalkers, in the past, but to know that you're in the same house as another entity so malicious it wears your own family's skin, it's terrifying. We went out onto the porch where my dad was, making extremely careful steps around the side of the house to get to the cars, and then we hopped in. We've never drove away so fast in our lives. We were practically speeding down the highway. My dad told Mom everything. She was so shocked, as were we. My dad called Charles again, making sure he was okay. He picked up and my dad told him that we were on our way to pick him up, and that we made it out successfully. Charles sounded so happy to hear that. The whole situation scared me, and I was basically crying in the back seat, not able to hold back my emotions. My breathing was very intense. I was hyperventilating. My mom did her best to comfort me. I was a young teenager, and this was very scary. We made it to Jake's house to pick up Charles. I hugged him so tight and bald in his arms, I was so happy to see him. I could tell that everything was okay. I don't know how we were supposed to go home whilst that thing might still be there. Maybe it left. My dad asked Jake's parents if he could borrow some weapons in case the thing was still there. My mum thanked them for taking care of Charles. Jake's dad gave my dad a shotgun and some shells to use just in case it was still at his house. We thanked them and got back in the car. Then we headed back home. My dad gave me and my brother pistols that Jake's dad gave him. Whilst we were still teenagers, it was better than nothing. And to be honest, I don't think any of us were thinking straight. But thankfully, he had taught us how to use a gun before. We would go shooting at my grandma's house up in the woods sometimes. We all had to prepare for driving up to the house. We went through my bedroom window because it's large and I always forgot to close it. It's in the basement, so we don't have to climb through any high windows. We got in, slowly making sure that the surroundings were okay before my dad went through my bedroom door first. I grabbed my knife by my bedside just in case it came in handy. My brother and I followed my dad as we did a complete sweep of the downstairs. I tried to remain as silent as possible, checking the cupboards and closets, nothing to be found inside. We started heading up the stairs, the silence overwhelming. Nothing but the squeaks of floorboards could be heard throughout the entire house. We made our way through the kitchen and into the dining room and the living room. All were clear. Finally, we had to check my parents' and Charles' rooms. We went through the former first. All was clean. Then we were stood outside Charles's door. I wanted to close my eyes as we went in. Dad kicked it open as we all looked around the room but found nothing. It had left the house. My mum, who had been waiting outside in the car, came into the house as quick as she could when we gave her the signal that everything was safe. Everything was fine. We were safe. We locked all the doors and windows, and we all slept in one room that night. That same night, I woke up to a scream I heard outside. Looked around the room. Everyone was fine. We were okay. We were safe. So I was able to get back to sleep, and had the best sleep I had had in forever. I know what happened was beyond bizarre. 
But now I know what the thing that replaced my brother was, and I thank God that we're all okay. This next story is titled, Did I See a Zombie Whilst Camping on Halloween? by Gorgamus the Great. This story is from my friend, whom I'll name Sebastian for privacy reasons, about an experience he had a long time ago. He told me in his perspective, Caution, some parts may be confronting. My name is Sebastian, and I'm an expert camper, hunter, and fisherman. I texted my friends to ask if they wanted to go camping to get away from all the trick-or-treaters this Halloween. My phone buzzed with replies saying yes. So I loaded up my biggest tent, some other camping gear, into the back of my jeep and headed to pick up my friends. I arrived at my friend's place, and they tossed their stuff in the back. Then we headed off. The trip was long and grueling as we looked for a place to go camping until I noticed a trail that looked kind of used but too narrow for the jeep. So we had to hike the rest of it. We unloaded the camping gear and set off down the narrow trail. Nature sounds filled our ears as we walked down the trail. Then, suddenly, all of the sounds stopped, and a strong smell of death and decay filled the air. It was awful. And not just that, we felt like we were being watched. I feel like we're not the only ones here, I said. My friends nodded, and we continued down the trail to get away from that smell. It lessened the more we got away from it until we couldn't smell it anymore. Then, up ahead, I saw the trail open up. It was a very gigantic open clearing with rows and rows of overgrown graves on one side, and some on the other. It was like a horror movie. We didn't know there was a graveyard in the middle of nowhere. But one grave stood out from the rest. The dirt was pushed out, creating a crater in the ground like it had been dug up. Not just that, there were pieces of rotten coffin pushed up and scattered on the ground, making us all feel quite uneasy. But, regardless, we set up camp on the far side of the area under the shade of the trees, putting up the chairs and setting a fire. And just as I was about to light it, that smell came back. And then I saw him. A man in his twenties... Around seven foot two and with a dark complexion, he started walking towards our camp. But his walking wasn't normal. Instead of walking upright, he was staggering, and his upper body was swinging side to side as he walked towards us. I also noticed his skin. It was at the beginning stages of decay, with pieces missing, forming red patches, and he was very, very thin. So skinny, his abdomen was sunken in. This was no Halloween costume. Whatever this thing was in front of us, it was real. I also noticed the flies buzzing around him when he got closer. He stopped at the cooler on the ground and pulled off the lid, knocking it over, spilling the contents inside. A pack of meat fell out, and he picked it up. His lipless mouth started to drool as he aggressively ripped off the plastic and pulled out a thick slice. He snapped his head backwards, flinging it into his open maw, before grossly swallowing it whole. The lump slowly pushed down his skinny throat, disappearing out of sight at his chest. He staggered off the way he came, out of sight. I thought we'd never have an encounter with this creature again, but I was very young. As night fell, we huddled together inside the tent. Then we heard movement outside. A deep, a deep hoo <sighs> sounded out. And I knew it was that undead creature from before. It returned for more food. Its bony fingers started to aggressively push against the tent. So naturally, being the heroic soul that I am, I yelled, RUN! We exploded out of the tent and ran all the way back to the car, driving all the way home, abandoning my camping gear and replacing it later. I still camp with my friends, but we promised to never set foot in that forest ever again after that experience. The question that I'm asking myself is, how many of those undead creatures are actually living? 
in that forest. I killed a skinwalker, but it got my sister. Story by Pleasant Peasant. I'm making this a large compilation of all my encounters with a particular skinwalker. I do have to give out a warning. Some parts of these stories are sad and gruesome. The first two stories have been posted, but the others have not. I live in the suburbs of San Antonio, Texas. My sister, who I'll call Laura, and I were driving along the road one night, and it was around 11 p.m. We were both hungry, and we decided to drive to Raising Cane's Chicken Fingers. It was a Friday night, so they were open till 1 a.m. Our parents were out of town for the weekend, so we were free to do whatever we wanted. That included watching scary movies, eating junk food, and staying up real late. Laura was 18 at the time, and I was 15. We had helicopter parents who didn't like us watching R-rated movies or staying out super late. Nevertheless, we decided to watch The Taking of Deborah Logan, an R-rated horror movie. We were pretty creeped out after it, and Laura didn't want to go outside, but I talked her into it by offering to buy her a meal. She reluctantly agreed. How I wish I had trusted her gut. We go to an exclusive private school where we've had to take back roads to get to it. It was very windy, forested, and with few houses spread apart. After about ten minutes of driving, we took a fourth turn, where it was the darkest. We weren't listening to the radio because we hated it, and there was a blip in the conversation. Our headlights illuminated a small herd of deer in the tall grass. At first, we thought nothing of it. There were a lot of deer near us, and it was pretty frequent to see some deer in the dark. However, as I looked a little closer, I saw something that seemed strange. I told Laura to slow down so I could get a better look. One of them scared the living daylights out of me. It appeared as though its skin was starting to fall off, and the skin that was still there had black bubbles on it. Its legs also looked broken like I had two knees on every leg. I looked at Laura, who had stopped the car. Her eyes looked glazed, and her mouth was open. When I looked back at the deer, it had its head cocked to the side. Then it started to slowly smile at me. It was very unnatural. Have you ever seen a dog look at you like it was smiling? It looked nothing, and I mean nothing like that. There are no words to describe it. I just knew it wasn't normal. My body froze at this point, and I didn't dare turn away from it and look at Laura. After about twenty seconds of it just smiling at us, it began to slowly walk towards our car. Thirty feet. Twenty feet. Fifteen feet. Then ten. Suddenly something roared to life in me and I screamed at Laura to floor it. There was no response. I turned and slapped her in the face. I know it's wrong to hit people like that, but I was trying to not die or whatever it was about to do to us. Finally, she woke up from her trance and put the pedal to the metal. We shot out of there as fast as we could. I didn't look back. When we pulled into the Cane's parking lot, we just sat there. Our appetites were gone. We were sat there for a good five minutes before I spoke up. What the heck was that thing? My sister never responded. We just drove home. We took the highway, even though it took us about fifteen minutes longer than usual. I didn't complain. Since then, we have never taken a drive on that road at night. And Laura and I have never talked about what that thing was. I thought that I would never see that creature again. But unfortunately, I was wrong. Almost a year later, I was out late, at about 9.30pm. I was part of a school soccer team, and that night we were playing on the outskirts of a poor area near New Braunfels, Texas. We had just flattened the other team 4-0. to zero. In my excitement, I decided that I was going to get some celebratory Whataburger. I called a location nearby, ordered, and hung up the phone. 
I started driving there. The road leading to Whataburger was some of the most sketchy houses I'd ever seen. One of these houses was backed up to the soccer field, and just a few hours earlier, I joked to my buddies that the house was definitely haunted. I wished I'd taken a picture. This place was terrifying. As I was passing near the house, something that looked like a human sprinted out of the woods on the other side of the road, causing me to swerve but still hit the dude. I was so scared that I'd just seriously injured someone that my red flags weren't going off. I jumped out of my car and ran to where the guy lay on the ground. But he was already getting up. As I got closer, I realized that this thing wasn't human, or else got in a serious accident before my car hit him. The figure was about seven and a half feet tall, and I could see it pop its arm back into place with a loud snap from where he landed wrong. I muttered, What the heck? under my breath, and it said, What the heck? in a high-pitched version of my voice that sounded so similar. As it turned around, it gave me that smile, the one I had seen almost a year prior. All I could do was run. It worked well enough the first time, and this thing didn't look like it could run fast without shattering its legs. While I had my back to it, I heard more of the snapping bones and saw something jump over me onto the roof of my car. In a split second, I deduced it was either a very large wolf or a small black bear. I changed direction to my left and sprinted towards the creepy house I mentioned earlier. The windows appeared to be boarded up, but there was a light on inside, and I figured if someone was in there, they might have a gun or something. I busted the door down with my shoulder, which was surprising because I'm only 5'8", and can't bench more than 140 pounds. The door must have been old and weak. As I stepped into the entryway, screaming for help, I noticed how empty, smelly, and dirty it was. In the living room to my right was a giant mass of hair, old blankets, and destroyed cardboard boxes. Crap, I thought. I just walked into his lair. I looked to my left and saw a bunch of human and animal bones, blood-stained walls and floor, entrails. I threw up. I wiped my mouth and continued running up the stairs. Just as I turned into the upstairs hall, I heard the monster roar and bang its way into the house. It appeared at the beginning of the hall just as I turned into a room. I grabbed an old metal chair and used it to break the glass and board it in front of the window. It broke, which was a miracle, but in that time the creature was right behind me. I pulled myself out of the window as I was dropping to the ground. One of the creature's claws caught my forearm just below the elbow. I barely felt it. I sprinted for my car. With the door still open and the key still in it, I jumped in and without closing the door, I hit the gas. I was out of there. When I was about five minutes away from Whataburger, my arm began to sting. I pulled into the parking lot and ran inside to grab a burger. As I speed walked in, the lady behind the counter's jaw dropped as she looked at me. I didn't have time to think about it though, because that thing could have been coming for me. When I got back home, I looked at my arm and noticed how much blood was there. I covered it with my sweatshirt so my mum wouldn't freak out, hurried inside, ate my dinner in my room after I showered, and cleaned the wound. It was about six inches long, and I still have a scar. All in all, I was lucky. I promised that I would carry a form of protection where I went after that. And I really wish I had actually abided by that promise. I hadn't seen the skinwalker for another long period of time. I decided to get my cousin, who is my age, and my sister, who is in college, to come camping with me. It was full break for us all, and we had five long days to have some downtime and talk to one another. When we got there, we were excited to see each other, and we chatted for a while. During this time, me and my sister were putting up the six-person tent, and my cousin was making the fire. It was a really fun evening. We sat by the fire for a long time, laughing and listening to music. We got into the time, of course, where we all wanted to tell scary stories. My sister's turn was first, and she actually ended up admitting that we saw that skinwalker in the first story. 
This was the first time in a year and a half that she had acted like she was there. We were talking about all that goodness when we all got a bad feeling at the same time. We were talking about it and decided to go to bed for the night. We all fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night to hear my sister screaming. My cousin and I jumped out of the tent and started running in the direction of the screams. And I saw it standing there, over her from probably twenty feet away. It was shaped like a werewolf, but I knew what it was. It must have been mad that she finally started to open up about the encounter. I started yelling at it and I ran towards it. I was really surprised when it started running away into the night. I stopped when I got to my sister. There was blood all over the ground and she wasn't awake. We decided we needed to run her to the hospital as fast as we could. The funeral was a week later. The doctor said that her heart had been pierced by a very sharp object, and she died almost instantly. While me and my cousin were alone after the funeral, I said, We need to go after that thing and kill it. It's been following me around for a long time, and we can't just let it gut Laura and get away with it. We need to get revenge. He agreed. His dad is really into guns, so he brought some rifles and pistols the next weekend to the same place with me. I brought knives, tasers, and a lot of fire because I've heard that fire is a skinwalker's weakness. We lit a nice big fire and started screaming out taunts to it and calling it a coward. As soon as we said that stuff, the forest went quiet and there was a strong wind. I saw it then. And it was standing at the edge of the light from the fire. It was approximately eight feet tall and humanoid at that point. The silence was broken as my cousin started shooting it with multiple guns at once. It didn't seem to be doing much more than paper cuts due to people. I shot it with my taser and it seemed to really make the skinwalker mad. Because it charged at me and threw me into a tree. I hit it on my arm and I felt it break. My cousin was still trying to shoot the thing but it was advancing on him with its claws out. I knew I was the only one that could finish it off with the fire in my pocket, so I pushed myself up. I almost passed out doing that because my head hurt and my arm was throbbing. Well, there was the image of my sister lying on the ground that kept me going. I ran to the fire and picked up the sword that my teacher had lent me. Wrapping cloth around it, I set it alight from the campfire. I ran at it and stabbed it through the stomach with the flaming sword. It started growling horribly and it twisted around before it fell to the ground, evidently dead. I mutilated its body just to make sure, though. Me and my cousin were terrified, but we wanted to bury it so no one would find it. As we were talking about doing that, it started to smoke, and the body itself shriveled up into nothingness. It was finally over. Although me and my cousin were successful in slaying this skinwalker, it did not satisfy me. It did not bring my sister back. The doctor said that my arm will never be the same and I will never be able to play baseball or any other similar sports again. I'm putting this full story out there because my sister deserves to have others know about her and how she really died. Everyone seems to think she died via falling down a steep hill and getting stuck on a pointy tree. But she deserves to have the real reason known. My sister was killed by a purely evil entity just because she told my cousin about it. Now that I know how to kill skinwalkers for sure, I'm going to kill as many as I can find before they can kill anyone else. There's Something Taking Native Women in Crow Country, Montana by C. Philly 100 I grew up spending the summers out in Montana, and I still make it out there when I can. Something that's been drawing a lot of national attention lately is the disappearances of Native women, especially in Crow Country, which expands far beyond the reaches of the actual Crow Indian Reservation. 
I first started hearing about these disappearances back in 2014, but every year there are hundreds of new missing persons cases reported in the region. Much of my family still lives in Montana, and they're pretty plugged in with the local basketball community. If you don't know, high school basketball is extremely popular in Montana, and many teams spend quite a bit of time traveling to and from games. My cousin recently spoke with someone who wished to remain anonymous from the Hardin basketball team. Hardin, Montana is on the border of the Crow Indian Reservation, where many of these disappearances are happening. The following is my cousin's telling of his native friend's account. We were on the bus traveling to Billings, Montana for an away game. We played a good game, but lost 28-24. We were on the bus back home to Hardin when we saw something running alongside it. It was dark, so I couldn't really tell what it was, but I figured it was probably just a stray dog or coyote or something. We got back to the high school, and I was getting into my truck when I saw something run out from behind the bus. There were still a few girls waiting to get picked up by their parents, so I grabbed my Ruger Black Oak revolver from the glove compartment and mag flashlight and started walking slowly to where I'd seen the movement from. I turned on the flashlight and looked around. I couldn't see anything, so I went back to my truck. The last girl's parents picked her up, and I turned on my truck. The high school backs up onto some open space off of North Mitchell Road, which is the road I have to take to get home. I was flipping through the radio stations, trying to get the forecast because it was supposed to snow later that night. I happened to glance up and saw something running behind my truck in the rearview mirror. I quietly cussed to myself before coming to a gradual stop. Once again, I grabbed my revolver and flashlight and started to open the door when something slammed into the outside of the door, effectively boxing me in. What I saw next was the stuff of nightmares. There was a face pressed up against my driver's side window, but it wasn't the face of a human or any animal that I know of. It had short dark hair and big yellow eyes with tiny black pupils. It had tall pointy ears on the top of its head and long sharp teeth hanging out over its mouth, which were shaped almost like a snout. It reminded me of a baboon's face. It was breathing on the window causing it to fog up. I was honestly stuck in a state of shock and for a moment I forgot I was holding a revolver. Almost as soon as I did, I could see the eyes shift to go from looking at me to down at the gun, and then back up at me. What happened next sent shivers down my spine. Its mouth twisted up in a cruel, gruesome smile. Before I could even raise my hand, it leapt back away from the truck, and that's when I got a real good look at the rest of its body. It was very dark, but it did seem to resemble a large dog of sorts, with a thick, dark mane, but mixed with the body of a human, if that makes sense. It had wide, muscular shoulders like a football player, and arms that hung down, with its knuckles touching the ground. It appeared to be crouching down, but even in that position, it was almost eye-level with the cab of my Ford F-150. Fearful that it might lunge back at the truck, I shifted into drive and began to pull forward. Instead of slamming back into the door, it jumped high into the air and landed on top of my trunk, denting the roof before jumping off the other side and running off into the night. I swear I almost had a heart attack, and drove the long way home, frequently checking my mirrors to make sure it wasn't still following me. This experience left me extremely concerned for the safety of the people in my community. I can't help but wonder if that demon has something to do with the disappearance of so many young women in my area. What if it got me? By Vasquezm27 Hi, I'm here to tell my story, and for the sake of privacy, all the names in this story will be fake. Now let's begin. Three years ago, me and my friend, let's call him Tom, decided to go on a camping trip. We got a week off for Christmas. I wanted to go on a camping trip, but Tom had other ideas. 
So I had to bribe him with buying him this new knife he wanted. But after he got the knife, he relented, and we set out for the trip. When we got there, it was beautiful. The trees were bright shades of green, and the sky was clear except for a couple of clouds. The sun was setting, and I set out to get firewood whilst Tom set up the tent. After a while, I got a lot of firewood that should last the night, and maybe through to the next day. While I was heading back, I heard a twig snap. I looked under me, but there was nothing, just leaves. So then, when I twisted my head around, I saw a tall figure go behind a tree. But that wasn't the oddest part. It had hoofed feet. I panicked, running back to the camp, dropping some of the firewood in the process. Once I got back to the camp, I told Tom what had happened. He didn't believe me, he just said, Stop being a wuss, you probably just saw a deer. So we went back to doing our business, and then roasted some s'mores. Then we went to the tent to sleep. After a while, I awoke to the sound of hooves. Then I smelt something off. Something very off. The scent of death and decay. Tom woke up and without hesitation said, What's that smell? I quickly covered his mouth, but it was too late. The noise stopped, and then we heard whatever it was scurrying into the woods. We went out to check, but all there were were hoof prints. My friend played it off as a wild horse, when we both know there are none in the area. I begged him to leave, but he said no, even though he was the one that I had to talk into coming. But after hearing my complaining, he agreed to at least take shifts. At first, I read a book to stay awake. Eventually, though, I drifted off to sleep. I woke up to Tom screaming and running at me. Then I realized he was running after me. I was being dragged. I looked up to see an eight-foot-tall slender creature with pale gray skin. The thing was so skinny I could see bone poking out from underneath, and it looked like it was wearing a deer mask. Soon, Tom caught up and started stabbing the thing with his new knife. Then, all of a sudden, it all went black. I woke up in the hospital. My head sore, and I saw my family, Tom, and a doctor sitting next to me. I asked what had happened. The doctor said, You fell down a hill and hit your head on a rock. You're lucky your friend here found you. I looked at Tom. I knew he had lied, but I didn't say anything. I was soon discharged and sent home. The next time I saw him, I asked why he lied. He said, No one would believe us anyway, and I prefer not to talk about it. Later, I decided to search what I saw, and according to the description, it was most likely a wendigo or a skinwalker. I know I won't be going camping any time soon. Over time, Tom and I grew apart. He now denies it ever happened. You can choose to believe me or not, but heed my warnings. Do not go into the woods unarmed. Now all I can think about is what if it had got me. Mysterious Creature Atop Business Sign by Tex-Mex Chex mex In my northern Mexican side of the family, stories of lechuzas, or shape-shifting witches and duendes, or little people, have always circulated when we all get together. My experience has to do with what I think was a lechuza, witch. On this particular Texas summer night, a year ago, about 9 or 10 p.m., I went walking down my neighborhood a few blocks to play Pokemon Go. For context, there's a small oncology facility about four blocks away from my home that I'd been parking at to play on my phone. The Pokemon game is location specific, and this location had spawns and hubs for items I needed. One day, however, an employee from the facility came out to the parking lot and shooed me away because it was, allegedly, private property. This facility has a huge marquee sign at the corner of the parking lot, about three stories high, 
closest to the neighborhood street it was on. It is not lighted. The marquee was only cement and semi-see-through plastic with painted letters for the clinic and some signs left there from the previous business in the adjoining suites. Next to the facility, or shopping center rather, there is an overgrowth of marsh plants and a little tiny swamp, followed by a church leading back to my house. Since I was walking on this night, I passed some houses, the church, the mini swamp, and didn't even go onto the parking lot for the oncology place. I could still reach the poker stops for items from the public area on the sidewalk by a bus stop. Still, I noticed this facility had hired a security guard who sat in his truck and made sure nobody unauthorized drove into the parking spaces. Anyway, I passed the facility catching Pokemon, headed towards a main street in my neighborhood as usual. I got to the main street, decided to finish playing for the night, and made my way back home. As I got closer to the oncology clinic, nearing my house, I passed by the security guard who was on his phone still in his parked truck. He took a glance at me through the clear glass of his window and went back to his phone. The parking lot was dimly lit by some light posts closer to the entrance of the facility. From the giant marquee sign of the clinic, I could hear a clicking noise coming from its highest point. I thought it might be something electrical, because I figured the sign was lighted at one point in the past, so I kept walking towards it. Mind you, the only two people within the line of vision were me and the security guard, safely tucked in his truck. There was a car or two that drove by, every five to ten minutes, but for the most part, I felt alone. As I was right next to the sign, my curiosity got the best of me and I decided to look up. Since the area was darkish, not completely visible, and considering my angle, I saw absolutely nothing. But from that nothingness, I heard a sound I will fear for the rest of my life. It's as if whatever was making those clicking noises saw me look up, and at that very moment, it let out a scream or screech or hell cry that shook me to my core to this day. The sound was a weird combination of a grown woman and what I imagine a gargoyle would sound like. As soon as he heard the noise, the security guard opened his truck door, stepped one foot out and lifted his head from the truck with the door still close to him, only to immediately retreat back into the truck. From my distance I could hear the locking mechanism from the security guard's truck doors. He apparently saw something I didn't because his face had an expression of fear I've only seen in movies. Immediately, despite there being a car passing by at this very moment, I pulled out my taser and gave it a few clicks in the direction of the haunting noise. But I still saw nothing. Whatever it was, I'm sure I scared it with the zaps, but the security guard still didn't come out of his trunk. He might have retreated into the thicket of a mini swamp, or just flat out flown away. Still shook, I pushed past the shock and decided to put my phone away, and put all my senses to good use. I cautiously passed the mini swamp and stayed alert for the last few blocks of my walk. Eventually I made it home and texted my aunt, who is probably my biggest confidant in reference to my paranormal experiences. Back in those days I had been cleansing myself from a dark time in my life when I dabbled in the occult. My mum got word from my aunt of what had happened on my walk, which was totally fine with me. My mum's response was that, Evil wanted me back in its grips. She said it was how the dark side responded to me leaving them. We're Catholic, and whilst my mom doesn't usually believe in some of these Mexican legends, when it came to this experience, I never heard skepticism from her. To this day, I still believe it was a bruja. It laughed. By Anonymous. I'm a generally big man, always have been one. However, I've never been confident, but for some odd reason I had the confidence to try out camping in the Australian bush by myself. Of course, there are no well-known cryptids other than the Bunyip, and I've been trying to find out what that thing was. 
I decided to do something around 2021, after the lockdown had been lifted. I was bored out of my mind, and I wanted to do something I'd never done before. I packed everything by the morning. It was a decent enough spot I went to in 2019 with some friends. Made the tent, unpacked everything, and decided to kick back with a glass of whiskey on the rocks. I had finished the glass when all of a sudden I heard the sounds of nails on wood while dragging metal across concrete tiles. I looked to the east where the sound came from, when I saw a red and white blurb whoosh past the great gum tree. Now on edge, I reached to my bread knife sitting on the little bench I brought. Head on a swivel, I slowly walked to my ute. My heart practically jumping out of my chest, I jumped into the passenger seat, to be surprised by the sound of feet on the roof of my car, then the sound of something tearing off the roof. And there it was, a tall red and white creature staring at me. The arms were long, but its legs were small and stubby a long, chubby torso, and a small head. The only thing I can recall with clarity is its face. Black, hollow pits for eyes and two slits for a nose. It looks at me, up and down, and grins. The teeth. Ugh, the teeth. They were filed into points, stained with blood and small spots of yellow where the blood didn't reach. It then jumped off of my roof and scratched into the side of the driver's side door. And then it just waddled away into a little hedge. I called off the trip, packing up everything, throwing a tarp over the roof and drove back home, my anxiety playing tricks on me seeing the thing's face in the rearview mirror. I couldn't sleep that night, seeing its face when I closed my eyes. I still have that trunk. Had it repaired. However, I don't use it often, other than moving stuff from place to place. And that's all I can remember, to be honest. Nighttime Drive Gone Bad by NG Foxy 666. All the names and locations have been changed for privacy reasons. This was a few days ago so it's fresh in my mind. If you've seen or listened to my other stories, you'll know I'm not the best at getting things down. My stories are all over the place, and autocorrect changes a few things, so I'm sorry if this story doesn't make sense. A few nights ago, I, an 18-year-old female, was invited to go to a Christmas party from some girls at school. I had a few friends, but I hung out with Derek and Mike. They're outcasts. So this was a big thing. The girl who invited me was named Hallie. She was one of the prettiest and most popular girls in our school. We were friends, and she was nice enough to me, but a bit harsh to my friends, Derek and Mike. I didn't want to go, but Hallie kept asking. I said no thanks, but the kids there are all your typical basketball player jock guys and cheerleader girls, who I'm sure didn't even know my friends and I existed. Derek has the hearts for Hallie, so when he found out, he pushed me to go as well. Hallie, in one last attempt, said if I didn't want to, I could just go, drop in, say hi, then leave. Giving into peer pressure, and satisfied with Hallie's words, I agreed I'd go if Derek and Mike could go. Hallie didn't seem happy about it, but she did agree. When the night came, I was a mess. I didn't want to go. The only thing keeping me from not going was all the promise of going there for 30 minutes and leaving. Now I'm an awkward girl. And being awkward, I get really drained hanging out with people. And I get drained ten times faster when it's with people I don't know or don't like. By the time I picked up Derek and Mike, I felt like I was going to vomit. We got there, and surprise, surprise, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Except the fact that it was on a family ranch in the middle of nowhere. I had to go up a mountain to get there, which didn't help my nausea at all. The party was good. Hallie and her friends were nice and introduced me to the other people at the party. I basically had to drag Derek and Mike along since Hallie kept forgetting about them. I knew most of the people from school. 
I was actually treated quite nicely there and hung with some of my other friends I didn't even know were coming. I did think maybe I should stay, until Trent showed up. He was the high school bully, and someone who would tease most of my friends. He teased me too, but not as badly as my other friends. I was leaving, and Derek was complaining about leaving Hallie's party. I then made a compromise that we could just go for a night drive, then come back. He agreed, and I stopped on my way out to say goodbye to my friends who I ran into at the party when I heard a voice in my ear. So, is it as bad as you thought? I turned, seeing Trent beside me. Not as bad, I said. But I'm leaving now. Really? Trent smirked. Because it seems like you're still here. His friends chuckled and shifted. Like I said, I'm an awkward girl. So I just laughed nervously, grabbed Derek and Mike and walked out. We got in the car, and I, the only one who didn't drink that night, was driving. Derek was in the passenger seat and had my handbag, so I asked him for the keys. As he passed them to me, a voice again spoke, causing me to jump. You're still not gone. Lo and behold, it was Trent. Whoa, jumpy are you? I'm fine, I just... I'm going for a drive, I said. Sweet. Trent said, pushing off the car where he was leaning. I thought he was leaving. Just another awkward interaction. When I felt the car door open behind me. So, where are we going? Apparently not, I thought. I was too tired to fight with Trent and honestly didn't care. So I let him come. I don't know, just driving, I said. Sweet, Trent said again. I kept telling myself to pretend Trent wasn't there. Apparently, I believed that a little too much. I became my normal weird self that I only let out when my close friends were there. I'm sure you know what I mean. I was laughing, joking with Derek, Mike, and even warming up to Trent. With the windows down, we were nearing the mountain peak. I was laughing so hard I could barely breathe, so I pulled over on a safe part of the road. Derek was on my phone. Somehow, I had service still. When Hallie texted me, sending me a photo of one of the guys in my history class being pushed into the pool, with the caption, Wish we were here, frowny face. Damn, dare you see that girl? Mike laughed. Derek turned red. I see what I see. You know, her smile, her eyes, her hair, her smile. Stop, dude, you're gonna make me puke, Trent laughed. I laughed too. I don't think you can help who you like, I said. Good on you for knowing what you like, dear. I felt weird, like something was going to go down. I think I thought it was a fight between our small group, so I self-consciously was trying to defuse the non-existent situation. Well, I was part right. Something did go down. It went quiet. I went to start the car when I heard a voice. Derek, help me! Hallie's voice rang out. What the? From the side of the car, we saw something moving in the woods from where the voice came. Derek, help me! Hallie's voice rang out again, in the exact same way it did before. A monotone with no emotion that sounded like someone had recorded it and played it again. Is that Hallie? Trent whispered, putting a hand on my shoulder and peering out the window. I don't think so, I said. There's no possible way she got this far without leaving before us. Derek, help me! Halfway through, its voice dropped inhumanly low. I sped off, sending everyone flying back into their seats. What the hell? Derek said, pushing my shoulder lightly. Warning next time, please. That was your warning, I said. Didn't you hear it? Didn't you see it? Trent said, almost yelling. No, what did you see? It looked like Hallie, but she was all wrong. She had arms that were too long and her knees and elbows bent backwards, Trent said. Yeah, that's what I saw too, Derek replied. Nuh-uh, I didn't see it, but I heard it. Last time it said, Derek help me, but it drifted into a growl, Mike said. Yeah, that's what I heard. 
We're all freaking out. We didn't go back to Hallie's party that night. We went to my house and crashed there. We explained to Hallie what happened. I didn't think she believed us until she asked Trent, who relayed the same story with the same amount of fear. There was another time Derek, Mike, and I were on a hike and something similar had happened. But that's a story for another day. There are a few questions that I can't answer. Why'd it call out to Derek? Did it know that he liked Hallie? Was it the same thing Derek, Mike, and I encountered before? How'd I get service out there? Did I know we were going to stop? What happened if we got out? Would Hallie believe us if Trent didn't come along? Why did Trent come along if he always picked on, annoyed our friends and me? Did he know what was going to happen? No, he couldn't have, right? Was this a prank he was in on? Why was he just as scared as us then? What if it wasn't us in the car? Why'd Mike and I hear the same thing but didn't see it, but Trent and Derek saw something different but didn't hear its last call? What would have happened if we stayed at the party? I guess I'll never know. And I don't know how to feel about that. Something I forgot to add was in the car, on the left, there was Derek in the passenger seat. We were in America at the time. Mike was on the left in the back behind Derek. I was on the right in the driver's seat. And Trent was in the back behind me. So we were directly diagonal from the person who saw heard it. I don't know what that thing is, but I'm never going on that mountain for a nighttime drive ever again. Thanks for stopping by for this evening's Outdoor Terrace. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed your stay this evening, and remember that there is always more content available on the EerieCast website, EerieCast.com. If you'd like your own stories to be narrated on the podcast, please submit them to darkstories.org. That's it for now. I shall see you the next time the sun goes down and the moon is bright.